I want to welcome everybody who's watching online. We're so thankful that you're here with us today. Those of you that are here in-house in Hendersonville, Tennessee, uh, I'm excited because we're starting this new collection of talks called The Elephant. And what we're doing during this time, during these next couple of weeks, is we're going to talk about issues that churches don't talk about. And we can all ignore well, churches don't talk about these subjects, but you talk about these subjects. And so over the next couple of weeks, like there's going to be some uncomfortable moments, some stretching moments, sometimes where we laugh, and we're going to be again talking about topics we normally don't talk about in church. So if you have like an irreverent sense of humor that like you're the one that tells jokes that are like just maybe a little over the line, I'm talking about you, Casey Sasser. If you're, you're one of those people, you're going to love this series, The Elephant. This week, we are going to be talking about, are you ready? The subtitle is called, The Preacher Only Wants Your Money. The Preacher Only Wants Your Money. That's what we're going to be talking about this week. And already, I can feel the tension of some of you guys. Like, I can feel that you got a little bit of perspiration underneath your arms right now. So let me just tell you, John, don't worry. We are not going to pass the offering bucket again. All right, we're not going to do that unless you ask me to. But like some of you guys especially are like, I would literally rather hear a sermon about anything. Like let's talk about circumcision if we have to, just not money. Like anything but money, that's how badly I don't want to talk about money. Marshall, I'll tell you what that is later. Don't worry about it. Just don't Google it, all right? Let's move on quickly. I want to tell you a story that I heard about this preacher, and he was doing what we all do, is he was starting a capital campaign. And he was starting a capital campaign because he wanted to upgrade their auditorium. And so he had this idea, this, this idea that I know what I'm going to do, and it's going to be great. What I'm going to do is we're going to pass the offering bucket around. And he stands in front of the church and he says, whoever gives the most money today will get to pick the next three hymns. And in his mind, like that morning getting to church, he's like, I'm so brilliant. This is totally going to work. And, and so he, he told the church, and, and they kind of had a reaction similar to, to, to what you have right now. And, and, and they passed the offering bucket around, and, and then they, they took it over to the side, and they counted to see who was going to be able to pick the three hymns. And, and the preacher was shocked because the person who gave the most money was the little old widow in the back, she gave a thousand dollars towards the capital campaign, and then the preacher was like, "Well, Myrtle gave a thousand dollars, so come on up, Myrtle." And and he said that, and and about forty five minutes later, when she made her way to the front, he said, "Now, now a deal's a deal, and you get to pick the three hymns." And, and, and she gets up on stage and she, she takes the microphone from, from the preacher and, and, and she looks over at the area where the college students sit. And she looks in particular over to the three college men that were sitting over here and she says, well, I choose him and him and him. But whatever it takes to raise money for a capital campaign. I want to start by seeing what Jesus said. And I'm going to let Jesus kind of set the table, kind of put the foundation on what we're going to build this message upon because you don't care what Jason has to say. I want to hear what Jesus said. And the reality is, is that Jesus talked a lot about money. In fact, if you take Scripture and you started to make columns, he actually talks more about money than he does heaven and hell combined. And that's interesting to me. And so I want to hear what Jesus said. So we're going to start off here in the tax collector's gospel, ir ironic a little bit. And, and I want you to hear what Jesus said. These are words in red in chapter 6. We're going to start in verse 19. And we have it up on the screen if you need it. And these are the words of Jesus. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourself treasures in heaven, where moth and vermin do not destroy, where thieves do not break in and steal. And this is important, like circle this one. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. 
And then he goes on to give us some great advice. He says, the eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. Now, time out for a second. Now, this is just kind of your view of how you see things. And this is so true. The eye is the lamp, meaning if you look at things through the lens of offense, then everything you see is going to offend you. If you look at the world through the lens of unforgiveness or from a victim mentality, you cannot see things in a healthy reality. And Jesus is saying, if you look at things through the lens of materialism, you will never fully understand the kingdom of heaven. Verse 23, but if your eyes are unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? Verse 24 is the crux of it all. No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate one and love the other or will be devoted to one and despise the other. And this is the key. Underline this. You cannot serve both God and money. Guess what? Good news. He didn't say you can't have both God and money. He didn't say that you can't, you know, want money or have money or have your money be a result of hard work. Nothing wrong with that. He said you can't serve and this is the part I want you to understand. God doesn't need your money, but he wants your heart. God doesn't need your money. Center Point Church doesn't need your money. I believe that God will continue this church on for generations, whether you give or not. God doesn't need your money, but he wants your heart. And let the words of Jesus echo in this place when he says you cannot serve both God and and money. And here it is. God cannot exist in a divided heart. God cannot exist in a divided heart. Here in Western Christianity today, we make up, we give it too much space in your heart for other things besides God. It's, it's like a, a place I hate but it's in the mall, and you go to, like, Build-A-Bear workshop, right? I hate it because I'm like, dude, I could have got this teddy bear at a yard sale for 25 cents, which I know where I'm going to sell it in about three years, but, but whatever. We don't need to go to Disney World because I'm goofy. And, and <laughs> I'm the idiot because I go take you to Build-A-Bear, man, and you're like, you know what? I want my bear to look like this. I want these clothes. I want this. In Western Christianity, we treat God like a Build-A-Bear, and God cannot exist in a divided heart. And God died on the cross through his son Jesus, dying on the cross not to be able to just have a little space in your heart. So where does this idea first start of what we give our money to God? And, and we've got to take it back to what is called the Mosaic Law. Now, Mosaic Law is just a really fancy term because it was the law that God gave to Moses. So you have the first five books of the Old Testament, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. This is the law. This is the Torah. This is the Pentateuch, all written by Moses. In Leviticus, we find the law called the Mosaic Law based upon the author. And that's where we see this idea of God wanting your heart and God wanting you to rely on him. Why do you think the writer of Hebrews is about faith that is impossible to please God? Because, because it's not that God needs you to believe in him for him to be powerful. It's that he wants you to rely on him. He wants you to be his daily bread, not to have a whole loaf in the pantry. And so in Leviticus, we see this right off the bat. Leviticus 2730, part of the Mosaic Law. It says, a tithe of everything from the land, whether grain from the soil or fruit from the trees, belongs to the Lord. It is holy to the Lord. Did you hear that? Scripture doesn't use that word lightly. It is holy to the Lord. You see, right off the bat in the law, now, now don't, don't start going, yeah, but, but PJ, we're not, we're not in the law anymore. Don't, don't start that. God established that Jesus said he came to fulfill the law, to complete the law, not to banish it. And, and so right off the bat, God set a rule in place so that you would constantly be aware right on the front end that this comes from God. Go read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and maybe the first chapter of Acts, and you let me know how often they tell you about possessions that Jesus owned or even a place that he lived. He spent his three years of ministry pretty much nomadic. 
No, I'm not saying you do that. But it's this idea that it was built in to remind people that God is the provider and that I recognize him as first in my life. See, the idea of tithe, and that word really means ten, tenth, giving the first ten percent of it, really shows you, and, and, and when they wanted to, to, to remind everybody that you are saying that I believe that all of this comes from God. And I want him to bless my finances. And I believe that I can do more with 90% of my money blessed by God than 100% of my money not blessed by God. And so we see this idea of stewardship versus ownership. Stewardship versus ownership. When you start off saying, man, like, this is mine. I've got this, I own this, I have this, versus stewardship where you say, God, it all belongs to you. It's my job just to steward it for a while. The stewardship goes further than just your finances. The stewardship goes with, this all belongs to you, God. My next breath is determined based upon if you want me to have it. None of this is mine. But then why don't we talk about money so much? probably for the very same reason that when you heard we were talking about money, you got a little uncomfortable. It's the preacher only wants your money. There's like preachers, lawyers, used car salesmen, like they, they just want your money. Let me just tell you a little bit. By the way, if it's your first time here, this is kind of a family talk. It's like an in-house talk. We don't do this all the time. But I just want to lay some things out. My salary, just so you know, is predetermined a year ahead of time in a meeting that I'm not in and it stays the same for the whole year. So it doesn't matter if you give here or not based upon how much money I make. In fact, if you're watching and you're somewhere that's not here and this isn't your home church, I still want you to tithe. I want you to bring it to the storehouse of the place that's pouring into you because I I don't care if you give here or not. I care that you're blessed. And I want every aspect of your life to be blessed. And God will not bless your finances unless he is first. And it's this idea of stewardship versus ownership. Now, I had a sermon prop hidden right here behind the speaker so that you wouldn't see it. And somebody threw it away. If you're in this room and you threw away my sermon prop, would you please stand up? Ladies and gentlemen, our newest deacon, Jeremy Deloach. I was talking to a friend of mine last week, Eric. I think he's watching. And he gave me this idea, and he talked a little bit about this. And I applied it to my own life because it really just happened last week. And, 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 and I want you to really take this in. Like, remember this, because this, there's a deep theological truth here to this. I took my kids last week to a gas station, and I bought them a Slurpee, all right? And it was like, you know, a big old Slurpee, and I made it for them the only way that a Slurpee is supposed to be, where half is wild cherry and half is blue raspberry. That's the only way. If you do anything else, you're doing it wrong. The Slurpees in heaven will be half wild cherry, and why are you laughing? (laughs) Then I taught them the trick. Now, you know the trick, you do the trick, you're going to judge me for doing the trick, but here's the trick, is you don't, well, they give you a dome lid for a reason. That's missing from this prop, but that's okay. You give me the, the, they give you the dome lid for a reason because you're supposed to also fill that up. But, but once you fill that up, like you put the lid on, then you fill it up, then you take a drink, and then you kind of look around and laugh a little bit, and then you take another drink, and then what do you do before you leave? You go... Fill it back up. Betty, I know you do that. (laughs) Fill that back up. Because really, it's still part of the product until you physically leave the store. And so, (laughs) so, 
anyways. So I fill this up. I walk out to my car. I surprise my kids with it. And they're like, he got us a Slurpee. And I'm like, absolutely I did because me being evil know how to give good gifts. And I hand it to them and, and they start drinking it. And I'm driving, and I told them, I was like, listen, if I hear y'all fight one time, because I'm going to buy two Slurpees. Are you serious? I work at a church. But, but, but if I hear you fight one time, Slurpee's gone, and I've done it before. And so we reach, like I reach back there a little bit later on the way home, and I'm like, hey, let me get a drink of that. Here's my daughter's reaction. I won't tell you which one. It's Mackenzie. I won't tell you which one. This is her reaction. Dad, this is ours. Don't drink it all. Here's what I did. I gave her the Karen look. You know what I'm talking about. It was one of these. Are you serious? Don't drink it all? It's a deep theological truth here. Don't miss this. Stewardship versus ownership. I bought that Slurpee. I took my money. I bought this 2006 Acura. Paid cash, y'all. I drove you here. I bought that Slurpee. I handed it to you. And now you're going to tell me, no, no, no. Don't drink it all, Dad. This is ours. Let's take it a step further. The only reason you're in this room is because I brought you into this world. I did 1% of the work. Your mom did 99%, but I brought you into this world. I wonder if that's how God feels when he gives us breath, when he gives us life, when he gives us gifts, when he gives us finances, and he says, I am giving this to you, and I am asking that you remind me on the, be remindful of me, mindful of me on the front end and give back what I have given you. Remember where that comes from. But if I can be honest, man, for the first probably 34 years of my life, well, God, this is mine. <laughs> no. Why do you think it matters that it's first to God? So, so we understand where it came from. Now let's pivot and let's talk about why it needs to be first and the scripture for it. And we go all the way back to Genesis. Right off the bat, we're going to see two brothers, the offspring of Adam and Eve, Cain and Abel. And we're going to see the blueprint as to why God needs to be first. We're in Genesis chapter 4, verse 1. Adam made love to his wife Eve. Thomas, can I get an amen? And she became pregnant and gave birth. And then you're like, oh, I take that back. <laughs> Sorry, let's, let's move on. She said, with the help of the Lord, I have brought forth a man. Later, she gave birth to his brother Abel. Now, Abel kept flocks and Cain worked the soil. So Abel is taking care of the animals and Cain is down in the soil working from the ground. Verse 3. These next five words are huge. Underline these. Write these down. In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. In the course of time, verse 4, and Abel brought some of the fruits. Nope. And Abel also brought an offering, fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. Underline that word firstborn. This is huge. Don't miss this. The Lord looked on fav favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering, he did not look on favor, with favor. So Cain was very angry and his face was downcast. What you're about to see is you're about to see the destruction of Cain, and it starts with this. Now, when you read things in the Bible, it's, you, you can't look at it through the lens of 2021. Because at this time, the world was based upon agriculture. So everything you look at, base it upon agriculture. The King James actually says, in the process of time, Cain brought some of the fruits. So there's three different ways you can take this portion of Scripture. 
The first way is this, is that Cain brought God something from the ground and Abel brought him a ribeye. So God is clearly in the business of us eating ribeyes because, because Cain brought him like tofu and something vegan and a little spring salad over here. And God's like, nope, don't accept that sacrifice. Bring the A1. <laughs> That's not true at all, I don't think. But the reality is there's two different ways to translate this. And historians kind of fall in a couple different categories. And I personally actually fall into both. There was either a defect to what he brought or there was a defect to Cain. Because remember, God is holy. And so if you come to him with a defect in your heart, a divided heart, something wrong with you, you can't be in the presence of God at this time. It was long before Jesus. But where I fall in is it's actually both. I think there was a defect in Cain, and because there was a defect in Cain, there was a defect in the offering that he brought. And here's why. God rejects the offering. Remember, I told you that it's agriculturally. So in the process of time, in Hebrew, it's literally translated at the end of days. With an agricultural society, it actually means at the end of the harvest. So Cain brings him what's left over when he knows he has enough to get through, and here are the crops that are left over from my harvest. This is what I'm going to bring to you, God. Now, we don't actually know what it looks like when God accepts a sacrifice and when he doesn't. Most likely, it would burn. Like, that's how he would know that he accepted it. But Abel brought it to him first. See, the point isn't the money, and the point isn't even necessarily obedience. The point is the heart. And the heart is saying, here it is, and I trust, God, that you will provide the rest. I recognize you. Now, I take this personally and actually expand it further than just my finances. So the very first bill that my family and I pays at the beginning of the month is to this church. That's the first thing. I was super, super convicted on this about five years ago when I didn't faithfully give because I would see my cable bill come in every month, and I would pay more to the cable bill than I did to the church. And if the preacher, like, made me feel bad enough, I might throw a 20 in there begrudgingly and thought, well, we're eating at home today. And, and, and really what it is is, is it's, a, um, it's a tip. It's not a tithe. It's just like when you go to, to, to eat and you're like, I got good service. I'm pretty happy with you, so here's a little something for you. And when, when I don't have good service, when I'm not super happy, you're not really going to get anything. And it's this idea. And, 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 and why do I think that your tithe should go to the local church, whatever church it is that's feeding you spiritually? If you're here and you're just visiting from out of town and you have a different church you go to, that's the church. Why? Because I think that the ground zero for the Great Commission is the local church. I think that most people, the, oh, the statistics show that over, over 80% of people that make a decision for God do so within the context of a church service. And spiritual growth happens when you're plugged into a church. Could you be saved without going to church? 100%. But I don't think you can grow, and I don't think that you can give back to the people and be used by God to the maximum capacity if you're not plugged into a local church. What's the difference between a tithe and an offering? Why do we say tithes and offering? Because an offering is something in addition. The tithe is the minimum. The offering is what you bring in addition. So if you have a nonprofit, if you have something that you support, if you have a missionary family overseas, those are your offerings. Those are in addition. We're going to pivot now because I think we've hammered the point home. God takes it serious. God can't live in a divided heart, and it needs to be first because the whole point of it is to us to rely on him. So let's pivot, and I want us to understand what a legacy looks like versus what a legend looks like. Legend versus legacy. A couple years ago, my wife and I went to Greece, and there was a saying there amongst guys in Greece, and it said this, society flourishes when old men plant trees under whose shade they will never sit. Society flourishes when old men plant trees under whose shade they will never sit. It's this idea of you're going to die. You are. The latest statistics came out and it said that 10 out of 10 people die. 
Now, there's a couple guys in the Old Testament that mess up those statistics, but we're rounding up. Death runs in your family. Danielle, you're going to use that later. I know you are. But the reality is, is that when you leave, one of two things is going to happen. You're going to have a legend, which is stories about you, or you're going to leave a legacy, which is stories about what did you do to impact people for the kingdom of heaven. And I want you to hear about Joshua. Joshua, one of the greatest men of the Old Testament. Joshua, who literally prayed for the sun to stand still. Joshua, who said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I just assume that he did that as he said that. One of the greatest leaders in the history of the church. But they missed something. They missed something. This is a portion of Scripture that breaks my heart. This is a portion of Scripture that actually makes me mad. And I want you to hear this. This is in Judges chapter 2, verse 10. So Joshua dies at 110 years old. Gerald, he dies at 110 years old. And as he's about to die, he talks. And he does what people who are 110 years old do. He talks for a long time. They've probably all heard this story before. (laughs) Forgive me. But listen to the next verse after he addresses them, after he reminds them of all the things God has done. Here we are, chapter 10, or chapter 2, verse 10. After that, whole generation had been gathered to their ancestors. Another generation grew up that knew neither the Lord nor what he had done for Israel. Then the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord and served the Baals. They forsook the Lord, the God of their ancestors who had brought them out of Egypt. They followed and worshiped various gods and people around them. They aroused the Lord's anger because they forsook him and served the Baals and the Ashtoreths. In his anger against Israel, the Lord gave them into the hands of the raiders who plundered them. He sold them into the hands of their enemies all around, whom they were no longer able to resist. And this is the part, my gosh, you don't want this for your children. Whenever Israel went out to fight, the hand of the Lord was against them to defeat them, just as he had sworn to them. And they were in great distress. This shows us that we are always one generation away from them not knowing the Lord. So, why does that matter? Because at some point in time in your walk with Christ, you got to understand, I've been saved for long enough. It's time to be spiritually mature and realize that I'm going to sow into something that will never add value to me. I'm going to sow into something that long after I'm gone, they won't tell the legend of Jason, but they'll leave a legacy of God using Jason for the kingdom of heaven. And at some point in time, we've got to be spiritually mature enough to realize that after you've been with God for a while, Your job shifts. Your job now is to pour into the next generation. I actually love, I went over there next door, down the hallway right before service, and it's chaos back there, man. It is loud. They're like throwing dodgeballs around in there, and there's babies crying. And don't worry, they're having a good time. But but a lot of people would be like, I don't know. They they probably shouldn't be. No. I would love if we had to pad the walls of this place because the kids' ministry is so loud and it's so jam-packed full of kids. Our, the average percentage, a goal for a pastor, is to have people 17 and under make up 10% of your church. We're in the 30 percentile. It's unbelievable. So y'all keep having them. Keep having those kids. No, I'm too old. Yeah, don't say that. That's what Abraham said. I, I, I want to show you something. I want to celebrate. Because you guys are incredibly faithful in giving. And I want to celebrate it. And I want to confirm what you're doing already and telling you that this is working. So recently, we sent some students to summer camp. And I stood up here on this platform and I said, I need your help. I need you to give. That month, we had two different, we had two different fundraisers. And I can tell you that not only was our tithes up, But the offering that you gave covered the expenses of every single one of those kids going to camp. Every kid that wanted to go to camp 
got the majority of it paid for. I want them to come up on stage for a second. We have a few of them here. Come on up. Some of them are serving upstairs right now in our production room. Grab that microphone on that box. Don't worry, you don't have to talk. Unless you want to. Just stand right here. So, so we had more than this. Again, they're serving. Some are in tiny town. Some are in production. Some are, are at home playing hooky. But, but I want to celebrate for a moment because when they came back, I heard some stories about some things that happened. So let me ask you guys, and you can just raise your hand if you want. Did any of you experience God in a way that you've never felt him before? Like you were closer to God because you went to that camp. I hope you say yes. Yeah. And one person in the group that's not here today gave their life to the Lord for the first time. There was a rededication. And since then, our Wednesday night student ministry is getting bigger and bigger and bigger every week. Every week. Now, here's what I want you to know. Is that I believe that if you gave money to that camp, if you gave money for the scholarship for these kids, everything they do for the kingdom of heaven for however long they live, you get a piece of that inheritance. If the Bible is true, then you get a piece of that. It's the greatest 401k of all time. Because after you're done, you've sown into this. I actually love Peter talks about the church being living stones connected to the saints. And so I love this idea of if you financially sowed into this, then this is a part of of what your legacy is. No one's going to remember how nice your car was 20 years from now. I believe Colin has the calling of God on his life. He's actually preached on a Wednesday night for our students before. <laughs> Have you ever heard Tristan sing before? Raise your hand if she's led you in worship. My goodness. Danielle has the gift of hospitality. Hospitality doesn't just mean when you welcome people into your home. It means that they feel comfortable when they're around you. She has such empathy and loves on people. And she, she single-handedly brings new people every single week to our Wednesday night ministry over and over and over again. The Great Commission goes through you. You actually bring more people to this church than most of they do. Most of, most of them do. And if you sowed into that ministry, whatever they do lives through you. I appreciate you guys. Yep. Anybody want to say anything? I didn't think so. Yeah. <laughs> I'm so proud to serve a church where I can say every single kid that wanted to go to camp, it was taken care of. I'm so proud that I serve a church that there's 90-year-olds who haven't been to physically a service here in years still mailed in checks for it. I'm proud to serve a church that there's people who left the church because they were mad that they got a preacher who wears skinny jeans. They saw, I wish that was a joke, but they still, one lady still sent in hundreds and hundreds of dollars because she sees what God is doing through here. When I was in eighth grade, I went to a camp, and at the time, we were going through a season where money was a little tight, and I remember going to my pastor and telling him, man, we, we can really only, my youth pastor, we can really only come up with about half of the money to go to camp, and he said, Jason, I got you. There's some people in the church that have specifically given money to help kids that want to go to camp, and so I went. I was in eighth grade, and it was this camp with about 300 middle schoolers, and there was this little Asian guy preaching that no one had ever heard of named Francis Chan, and he was speaking at this camp, and I gave my life to the Lord. Here's the best part. I have no idea who in the church gave that money, and they have no idea what their money, which student it went towards. We've never met. But what's that going to look like? When they get to heaven, 
And God says, hey, you remember that $200 you gave, that insignificant amount that you gave years and years ago? You gave that. That person got saved at that camp, and now generations of his family are going to know the Lord. And now for a living, he stands in front of people and tells that story of how generosity changed generations. And imagine what that's going to look like for them when they get to heaven and they start seeing all of the returns of the money they gave trickling in as their inheritance grows and grows and grows until Jesus comes back. It's all about perspective, and money is a test. Money is a test. I know three people personally that are the three wealthiest people I know. They also happen to be the three most generous people I know. One of the men donated our sign up here in the front. He didn't even live in this town. Donated that sign. Donated us a billboard coming right through Gallatin. When I was a youth pastor one time, we needed $100,000 to finish this building. He wrote the check. He says, I can't give money away enough. Like every time I give money away, God just brings me more. And I'm like, I wish I had that problem. So let me pivot to this. Let me tell you what our vision is. Again, this is just in-house and what I'm going to ask you to pray about. Most people get saved within the church confines of a church service. Most people grow spiritually at a church location. And it's time that we invest back in this place. So let me tell you what we're going to be doing. And it was passed unanimously by our board is we're going to be creating over the next couple of months, you're going to see a lobby starting to be built. It's going to take this building and Kid City and combine them. And it's going to be a beautiful building with glass walls on both sides that can be seen from the street, a natural gas fire pit in the back with seating around it. We're going to have a coffee shop. We're going to have comfortable seating. Why? Because I want this to be a place where community is. I want this to be a place where people are sitting around and they're enjoying each other. We're also going to be doing an entire renovation here of the auditorium. Because in case you can't tell, some of this stuff's a bit archaic. And it's time to invest back in this property. You may never see it completed. I hope you will, but you may never. But here's my goal. My goal is for your grandchildren and your great-grandchildren to get saved at Center Point Church, to grow at Center Point Church, to be men and women of God at Center Point Church. And here's what I'm providing you with. I am providing you with an opportunity to be an early investor in that. Because the earlier that you invest, the more dividends it pays as it grows. Center Point Church is a growth stock. I don't know if you can tell. It's growing and growing and growing. God keeps bringing men and women here and kids here. So what we're doing is this. We're starting a 90-day generosity journey. And here it is. For the next 90 days, if you want to be on that journey, when you give online, you'll have your information there. On the generosity envelopes next to you, write your name on there. And here's what we're, we're, we're doing. It's wild. It's a 90-day generosity journey guarantee. If you've never tithed before consistently, my challenge to you is to do that for the next 90 days. And at the end of the 90 days, if you don't believe that God has blessed your life in any capacity, you will get 100% of that money back. That's how confident I am that blessings follow obedience. If you do tithe faithfully, just so you know, I have no idea who gives in this church. I really don't. Thomas can tell you. Some preachers do like to know. I don't guards my heart. A sing, no, not a single one of you could give and I wouldn't know. But here's what I'm going to ask if you are a faithful tither and I, when my family's going first is I'm going to ask that you over the next couple of weeks give a one-time offering. Not a tithe. An offering. And I want you to pray about what God wants you to give. I already have the amount that God told me to give and it's going to hurt a little bit. But sacrifices do hurt a little bit but I'm not going to stand up here and ask you to do something that I'm not doing also. You'll see a box in the lobby. It might even be there right now. And here's what's really cool, is that you can drop your money in there each week. And my kids went first. There's $3.63 in that box right now. 
dollar bills and coins because my kids wanted to go first. I'm providing you with an opportunity to invest in what God is doing here. We'll end it with this. Too many churches today are playing defense. What is defense? It's protecting what you already have, protecting what you've already done, keeping the lead and hoping that the time runs out while you still have it. If you're a Titans fan, you know what Jeff Fisher did all the time. Too many teams are on the defense, man. Too many churches are on the defense. They've got to protect what they already have. But Jesus wanted the church to be on offense. Jesus said, no, 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 go out into your community. You are the light of the world. And I want to present a place that the world comes into and that we say this is a place where you were made on purpose and for a purpose. This is a place of community. This is a place full of broken people that need Jesus, and we attract the people. But people are attracted to excellence, and I need excellence. And I can't think of a better way to spend my money than investing in the future of Center Point Church. We've given a lot as a family to invest in this place, and I would do it again in a heartbeat. I'd give twice as much if I could. And I'm excited for this journey. Are you excited for this journey? Come on. It's called a legacy fund. So if you put anything in that offering envelope, and it's an offering, not a tithe, put legacy fund. If you give online, there's a drop down that says legacy fund. So into what God is doing. And let's walk on this 90-day generosity journey together. You have nothing to lose. I will give all your money back. You have nothing to lose. But we have eternity to gain for this community. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you that you set the example that you gave. You gave the life of your son, and you gave till it hurt. And I echo the words of, that you gave Malachi where you say, test me on this, and the floodgates of heaven of my favor will pour upon you. I pray that, God. I pray blessings upon everyone here. I thank you, Lord, that even during the seasons where I was an owner and not a steward, God, that you still pursued me. And what Tom said is you, you love me just the way I was, but, but you love me too much to keep me that way. And, and, and God, I just pray that as we enter this season, Lord, that you will speak to us in a way that we've never heard before, God. I pray that amongst all of the people right now, prayer requests have been flooding in the last five days. People with anxiety and, and hurt, and confusion and loss. I pray that they lean into you. And your word says you'll lean into them, God. For generations and generations, may we declare your name. May we declare your name, God. I love you. I praise you. And I would do anything for you and all God's people said. Amen. We really enjoyed spending some time with you today. If this message impacted you in any way, let us know. We want to hear your story. You can contact us at centerpointtn.com. We can't wait to hear from you.